Good morning. This is Playing to Win with me, Mark Henderson Leary, and my good friend, Brad Fryer. How are you, sir? Man, I'm doing good. How are you? I'm really well. I want to talk about something today. It's a very important subject. It is, okay. it is preparation. <laughs> preparation. You know, that is a great, great topic. Yeah. I mean, Do you have th- thoughts on the subject? You know, I think it's imperative. You know, what can be a byproduct of lack of preparation? Uh, awkward silences. Uh, awkward laughter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that moment when the light turns on and you have the blank stare. Yeah, lack of preparation. Uh, so, uh, like, yeah, you can get ask a question and not have a good answer. Yeah, yeah. You know, what? actually, I, I would. I, I really, <laughs> this could be a good one. This could be a good. What I think is funny about lack of preparation, though, is it does, um, and there's lots, lots of material here, uh, and so get ready because this actually flows into two subjects, which is just you know preparation, as you, as I literally mentioned it, but also uh, the dummy curve, because what I have, um, and this is one of my favorite sort of awakenings, was that I felt like a badass salesperson when I, at the early early days, because I could wing it. Like I yeah. ne- like people would say, we're going to prep for this. Like, man, I don't prep for anything, man. I just yeah. go in there and I do my thing. Pow, pow, pow. And it's just great. And then <laughs> <laughs> it's like preparation, only amateurs prepare, you know, I'm a pro. And yeah. then, uh, then life sort of taught me a lesson about that one. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, no, so you yeah, want to explain the dummy curve and, and, and yeah. how that, well, you know, it's funny because, um, I mean, so many thoughts start running through my head right now when, when with this topic, uh, much like you. Um, I came out of college and didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And I, and I stumbled into a sales job as my very first job out of college and, uh, you know, ex- excelled at it and hit the ground running. And, and just, you know, I was one of the ones that I invested in myself. You know, I went to Brian Tracy and I went to mm. Ziegler and I went to those seminars. And then I would reach out to the number one producer on our team and say, Hey, can I follow you for a day or two? And, and so I was always trying to find the, the best ways to do things. <laughs> Uh, you know, honestly, it's because I wanted to find, try to find a shortcut, right? How do I how do I get to success as quickly as possible? Um, but in hindsight, to your point, if if you'd asked me what my process was, I would have said, I mean, every situation is different. I just you know I play off of whatever they give me, and yeah. you know, with no preparation, no planning, yeah. and I and I was successful. Every company that I worked for, I became top producer on team without a process. And, um, I, I look back in, in hindsight and my, my, my motivation was always to be the top producer, but then whenever I got to that level, then I would just kind of cruise. Right. And, yeah. you know, you remember the, the movie 16 candles I do. when, um, Raleigh, Molly Ringwald and, um, um, uh, Anthony Michael Hall are sitting in the, in the, at, they're at the, uh, the dance and they're sitting in the car in the tech room the shop shop tech and they're, they're talking and and she says you know farmer ted or whatever and he's like yeah i'm kind of the king of the dipshits you remember the king line? of the dipshits yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah i remember that for sure that that sums up my yeah. early sales career right oh, i feel like yeah. i feel like i became the king of the dipshits but there was so much more potential Right. Then I get into right, Sandler right. and i realized oh, Sco- schoolyard ball you were killing it at schoolyard ball no coaching at- that's right we didn't have jerseys, but I was the best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so so then you get into the, the the world of professional selling, right? Where people actually invest time, energy, and resources in having a game plan, having a strategy, maximizing opportunities, not just you know winging it and shooting from the hip. And um, the the I, I actually did an interview two weeks ago for a client, and. The person I was interviewing was very adamant that you have to know, you have to be an expert at your products or services before you can go out and start selling them. And I said, well, why do you feel that way? And she says, well, you just, you need to be able to answer all the questions. You need to know the ins and outs and you need to know where you're going and blah, blah, blah. And I said, I said, so if I were to tell you that I, I was the new guy at one of my jobs for three years, what would you say to that? And she looked at me confused. She goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, I used to walk into sales calls and I would say, hey, I'm the new guy. Can you help me out? And what would people do? People would try help to help you out, man. Yeah. 
And so, you know, so did so, you learn? So that technique that did you learn to do that? Did, did somebody teach you to do that, or did you just figure out it worked and you didn't change it? I, I figured out that it worked um, in my third sales job. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. And, After and the, was, three is a pattern, right? One, three is a pattern, <laughs> which, yeah. Yeah, my first sales job, I was there for probably eighteen months, and, and I just, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know. Second sales job, it was the typical. You know, I was in medical sales at my second sales job. And so I wanted to be that I'm selling to doctors and surgeons. And so I wanted to be that polished, you know, whatever. Uh, by the third job, I was like, you know what? I'm working too hard. This, this can be easier. And so I started doing the new guy thing when I was the new guy and mm-hmm. it worked. And so I just kept saying I'm the new guy. And I did that for like three years. <laughs> <laughs> so, so fast forward to Sandler. And Sandler actually has a technique, which, which you referred to, um, called the dummy curve. Uh, and, and the dummy curve principle is that when you're new in sales, when you're the new guy, you don't have a whole lot of information to share. You don't have a whole lot of expertise. And so what do you do? You, you want to keep the conversation rolling, but you have nothing to talk about from your end. So you ask questions and you ask questions like, so, so give me a lay of the land. Help me understand. Well, why are you doing it that way? Because you don't know any better. So you're just looking for information and hoping to drag the meeting out for 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah the connection, but, the connections looks like it's, it's kind of breaking up there. So I'm going to try to, what, what happens in the first part of the dummy curve is that you you don't know. And so you're asking questions. And and I think from my experience, it's fair to say that, you know, I was almost desperate to to get answers. So I would be very attentive and and ask as rapidly uh, salient questions as possible. And, uh, and people would learn a lot about me, I would learn a lot about the process, uh, just because I had nothing else to to lean upon uh, is other than asking those questions. And so what we've discovered is that that beginner, that be, that's one of the secret ingredients in beginner's luck in the selling process is those questions are really powerful. And we now know that, that 80% of the conversation, so sorry. no problem. I, I, I did my tap dance and was explaining the, uh, the, um, the whole process of, of the first part of the dummy curve and you're back. And so I was just saying that what we've discovered is the, um, kind of the secret sauce of beginner's luck is all of those questions coming from people uh, trying to get those answers and helping that client feel really heard and get all of their pains and situations out on the table. And so creating a real and powerful bond. And so what happens after that? Yeah. So the next thing that happens is you get trained, right? You get trained on features and on benefits and on uh, differentiation in the marketplace and on uh, the history of the company and on leadership and you get all this data in your head for what you're selling and and why you're selling it and why you're better and yada yada and so the the natural tendency is to show up and begin to educate the prospect and so you know in fact i i know that some of the training i went through in the corporate world was you know i would have a marketing person or an engineer standing at the front of the, the, front of the room telling us here's how you sell our product. You know, here's what our yeah. product does. Here's how it helps them. And here's what you tell them. Here's you know, the list and, of answers. You don't need questions. Even, <laughs> here, exactly. Here's, it, it, wasn't even, it wasn't even answers. It was just, here's the dissertation yeah. about why we're the best things in the flesh bread. And so I'm wind you up, I'm going to wind you up and then you're going to features, benefits, yes. features, benefits, fast, slow, yeah. strong. Well, can, I, can I get you a quote? <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, so, so you go from being um, the, the newbie and not knowing enough, so you ask a lot of dumb questions, to being the amateur where you know a lot of data and you just can't help yourself but to share it. And the goal with the dummy curve is to get all the way back up to the other side where you're the expert when it comes to the information, the technology, the, the terminology, the features and benefits, but more importantly, you know when and how to use it. And so right. the, the professional does what the dummy did, but he does it on purpose. Uh, you know, I, I want to highlight the bottom of the dummy curve, though, because that's I think people need to be really aware of the signals that they're in, the, in that trough of the amateur, because a lot of amazing professionals get stuck in the amateur phase. And what that is, is I heard three words. I can name that tune in, in one note. 
and I can tell you what you need. I don't need to hear anymore. In fact, I just I just saw everything I need to quote you just by driving in. And in fact, we don't even yeah. need this meeting. I'll get your quote later today. And yeah. and people who are smart and 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 this is actually there's a couple of pieces that go into this. You can start to feel like you need to be smart based on the position. And other people always felt like because they were smart, that was their value to the conversation. Smartness yeah. answers. I have all this, and so people have a tendency to. A want to want to show off that those answers and feel like and B feel like it's their obligation and their value to give those answers quickly, efficiently, and 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 sort of short circuit this whole process. And what we've discovered is that is that is really the fastest way to destroy your close ratio, to alienate your client, to miss the golden opportunities, to commoditize yourself, to look like just like everybody else who's doing the exact same thing. And so the burden becomes to elevate to the other side of the dummy curve, which is as you were kind of introducing sort of re dummy that's the dummy side but intelligently so so say more about that how do we do that yeah so i mean i, I really like the way you put that because you know we we do feel like we're bringing our value our expertise our our experience whenever we tell whenever we push whenever we um whenever we believe that we know what they need before they've even told us the, the problem is, is that it's not true until the words have come out of their mouth. And so we have to hear it from them because it might not be true. We might be making gross assumptions. And so on the professional side, it's it's all about asking the questions. And and, and we call it a dummy curve because sometimes sometimes the best questions are just the dumb questions like, huh? <laughs> you, know, that, <laughs> you don't have to be these brilliant, long, drawn out questions. But, you know, help me understand. What do you mean by that? Can you give me some examples? You know, these are just some very simple, dumb questions. You know, hey, when you say that it's 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 a big problem, what do you mean? What what's big in your world? Or when somebody says, "Oh my one. God, this is possibly costing us a million dollars a year in, in downtime." A million dollars. I mean, is that a lot of money in y'all's world? You know, and yeah, I love and asking those a lot of salespeople feel like I can't ask a stupid question because it'll make me look stupid. But if you're scared of that, all you have to say is, look, this may sound like a stupid question, but. Yeah, the, the two, the two, I, it's my favorite questions in that category, one's really hard and one's not that hard, but, and one is, why would you do that deal? Why would you do this deal? Why would you switch? And that, that was the very best, but you don't, if, if you're co not comfortable asking that question, I get it. You should work on the, all the things that go behind that. It's probably a whole other episode to talk about the, the negative selling and the concepts that go with sort of challenge in that regard. Really, really powerful. Makes a lot of people uncomfortable. But the, but the one that you, you hit was, was really important. That relativity question that let me sync up with a million dollars. Let me just check in. Is that a lot of money? Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes it's hell yes, that's a lot of money. Okay, so this is important. Is this fair? Okay, so I'm I'm starting to sense that you really do want to move forward on something that would solve that problem. Yes, we would do that. Okay, well, walk me through that. What what's the rest of this process look like? And you can maybe chart a path to a close. But but you have an experience. What was your experience when you asked that question? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've asked the question a lot of times. And one time it caught me on my uh, caught me off guard because I was talking to a, a large wealth management firm, downtown Houston, um, talking to the principal of the, of the organization, having a great conversation. He's talking about a specific group that he's trying to build out uh, to handle this specific sector and yada, yada, yada. And we're having the, having the conversation. It's unfolding nicely, asking good questions. And then we quantified the impact of the problem that he's having. And the quantification was, you know, uh, somewhere around 12 to $15 million. And, um, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, whoa, all right, here we go. And uh, I asked him, I said, well, you know, 12 to 15 million. I mean, is that a lot of money in y'all's world? And he said, no, it's not. <laughs> and, and I <laughs> kind of took pause and I said, okay, <laughs> so, so what, what would you suggest? And he goes, I just don't think us doing anything to change process, to create structure, to teach, really makes sense for that small of a return because it's not gonna be worth my time to invest all these people to, to achieve that. And I was like, so, so what does that mean about that division? He goes, you know, now that we're talking about it, I don't know that that division makes sense. You know, we might need to just scrap that. And I was like, whoa. So, <laughs> I mean, I, so you know, 
That's awesome. That's because that's a really powerful question. You were able to add value in the process. And actually, this yeah. is a whole other subject. If we want to talk about truly coaching and consulting in a in that challenger type situation where you've got somebody coming to you and you're pushing back like, Hey, I don't know if this makes sense. I'm hearing yeah. this. Help me understand yeah. why you would do that. Sometimes you can give some people some real wisdom just by repeating back to them what they've already told you through a slightly different lens of your curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's been several sales calls I've been on over the years where the, the ROI didn't justify the, the time, um, effort and expense of, of changing what they're doing. You know, and I would often say, well, I'm confused. Um, you're telling me this, but you're saying you want to do this. The two just don't seem to add up. What am I missing? Right. And one of right. two things is going to happen. They're going to say, well, you're not missing anything. That's exactly right. And then you say, well, God, it doesn't sound like it's going to be a good fit. Or they say, well, here's what you're missing because it's really this and it should be that. And, you know, they begin to explain it to you. But the dummy yeah. curve is is a way of just... You know, the, the Sandler rule is you know, our value in sales is measured more by the information we acquire than by the information we dispense. And so our job in sales isn't to go out and educate the heck out of people. Our job is to go out and learn about people. Right. Learn if there's a gap between where they are and where they want to go. Learn if, if, if that gap is big enough to justify implementing uh, change to affect it. Um, learning if, if what we do is a potential fit for filling that void. Which is different than knowing it, which I think is the essence of the, of the concept here. N learning it versus knowing it. The process of oh. learning it is, is what we're after. And, and great, you, great you, you talk, I like that a lot. What, what, you, what you described of like, hey, I hear A and B, and that seems like a weird situation. There, is, there a, is there an A.5 that I don't know about? Well, help me understand. I have classically in my life been ex felt as though I'm expected to know. And yeah. so when I hear a conflict between A and B, my mind is racing. I'm trying to figure it out. And it has been years and years of training and self-coaching to say like, Mark, that's your opportunity. Ask, ask, ask. And it's not yeah. easy. It's really hard for me even today to not to want to try to know the answer. I feel like yeah. it's kind of a self-worth thing. So for me to just to kind of get really comfortable and like, as I'm listening and I'm hearing stuff go on, I just kept trying to get really fast at like, Hey, slow that down. I didn't, I didn't understand what, when you went from A to B, I, th I did, I miss something Do I, and like, well, okay. Yeah, there is a piece. And, and I've never been, uh, I've never regretted asking that question or anything around my curiosity and being uh, open about what I don't know. And that's, yeah. uh, that, that's taken a leap. Yeah, and I think you I think you hit the nail on the head because so much of what we do in sales is based off of our perception of what we think the role should be. Yeah. You know, I have salespeople challenging me all the time saying, Well, Brad, I mean, you know, we're the experts. You know, if they ask us, you know, what do we do or how can we help them, which is, you know, which is a great opening line for a prospect, right? Well, hey, why are you here? Um, what can you do for me? Um, you know, what do you tell me about you? And as soon as the prospect opens that door, salespeople feel like they have to bust through it and put their best foot forward and educate and entertain and show them how great it's going to be. But that's not the case at all. Um, you know, some of the some of the worst sales calls that you could possibly run are the ones that the salespeople fe leave feeling really good because they got to talk about their products and services for 30 or 45 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how'd the call go? Oh, it went great. You know, I've talked about this. I've talked about that. I educated the hell out of them. They gave me all the buying signals. You know, they were nodding and smiling and asking riveting questions. Well, what was their problem? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think they, whoa. <laughs> you know, stop right there. If you're thinking you're not doing your job. You know. Yeah, I think if you're if you're an expert in this and you want to be an expert in the sales process, uh, the expertise you need to gain is not in the answers as much as you think. I mean, the answers are always lurking, and you'll there mm -hmm. there will be an opportunity. Like if you have some cool trick shots, you're going to show. You know, hold on, there will be a time to like watch this. Watch me put the you know the eight ball in the quarter pocket, on, and we're, you know that's that's totally cool on, at the right moment. Your expertise that's more powerful is in the process. It's being able to say that we don't know what the problem is, but we will find out. And, and there's a way to do that. And it's not easy because if it were easy, someone else had already done it. You already figured it out. The reason you've come to me is because it's a big problem and you need to really get this right. And that is in the form of process, not 
you know, A equals B, we're done. So think about the process. Think about how you're going to have to unwind it and discover and lead the client on a short, hopefully, or appropriately length journey so they can get to really what matters most below the surface because there's you're probably cutting through some level of surface uh, misleads. You're going to have to work your way through that. Well, you know, and, and I don't know if you ever heard the the analogy, but, you know, selling like a, uh, a country doctor. Mm hmm. You know, um, I, I absolutely love my general practitioner. He uh, had a relationship with him for several years. He's he's a uh, uh, South African, got a, a strong accent and just dry wit. And he's absolutely hilarious. Um, but there's been several times where I've gone in and I thought I knew what was wrong with me. And so I'd walk in and, you know, say, hey, you know, I think I got this. Can you blah, blah, blah. And he's like. Is, is that your name on that that, that, that over there? No, no. What does it say under my name? It says MD, right? Yeah. Let me do my job. You sit there and shut up. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and, and he does it with the dry wit. But, you know, the, the process starts with, you know, I'm going to check your vitals. And then I'm going to ask you some questions. And then if we feel like based on your vitals and the questions I ask you, then we're going to line out tests. But the first test is this one. And then it's this one and then it's this one and you're going to follow my my lead on this. You're not going to come in and tell me I want, you know, doc, my, my I blew my ACL. Can we schedule surgery? Well, hold on. Let's let's talk for a little bit first. What happened? What took place? What did you feel when it happened? OK, well, the first step is going to be an X-ray. Let's make sure there's nothing structural first. Then we're going to do an MRI based on the MRI and the damage. Then we'll decide maybe physical therapy. Then if, if physical therapy is not, a, then we'll plan for surgery. But it's a progression, right? Um, and so in sales, I mean, it, in sales, leadership, parenting, all the above, thinking as a country doctor is, is a great rule of thumb because you lead with discovery. You lead with asking questions, which is the dummy curve. It, and I want to kind of add some color to the new, to the complexity of what you just what we're describing. And if you can be the country doctor, if you can sort of flow into the persona, that's great. But there's a couple components that I that I need to be teased out for a company with a sales team. And the first piece is that uh, the ego and the attitude of the salesperson has to go in with that humility, that or that just the commitment and discipline, if nothing else, that you have to draw it out. But below that is the process component. If you yeah. are an individual, you write your own process, you understand exactly what comes to the table. But if you are an organization, you got multiple salespeople, and you don't have a structured sales process, you know, three to seven steps that, that really say, this is the questioning process, this is the, ch the testing, or however you create the space. If you're leaving your sales rep to sort of figure that out, that's you're leaving a way a lot to chance and most of your sales reps are not going to be up for that. You've yeah. got to provide like, this is the part where you shut up and live Listen. And so they can have that co commitment and discipline and then teach them the skills to do that well. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. And, and you know, for, for so many salespeople, the ego is such a big role in that, right? Yeah. Um, because we feel like we want to be the know-it-all. We want to be the expert. But man, you bring so much more value to you when you know everything, but you understand the value of knowledge, right? You know, knowledge yeah. and, and being an expert uh, isn't about, you know, learning karate and then going onto the playground and kicking the crap out of the kids because you can. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. it's it's the knowledge and understanding and knowing when to use it appropriately. Well, and there's a confidence that goes with that, too. If you if you totally. go in and, and you sit and you're like, OK, I'm going to ask questions and you sit down against your prospect and he's or she is tougher than you says, all right, can we just get the quote? Okay, you get the quote. Like you have yeah. to be able to say, and, and that's where sales process and leadership and management has to sit behind you. And say, hey, um, um, I like to, but unfortunately, that's not the process. Our process is X, and I really like to coach people that like if you sit down with somebody who's trying to break your process, mm -hmm. then you've got a real opportunity to say like it's either decide if it's not a prospect for you, which is a which is part of the possibility, but also to go back to the client or even just demonstrate for the client that you have a process and that their mm -hmm. the past solutions didn't work and they're in front of you for some reason, and that right. reason might be that they need an expert, and until then they have felt 
like, and this is actually the psychology I think I want you to pay attention to. Until they sat down with you, they felt they had to be the, the expert. But now you're going to say like, you can relax, Mr. Or Mrs. Client. I'm the expert. I have the process. Sit down. I'm going to, I'm going to take it from here. Like your doctor says, like, you know, Hey, like, you know, if I'm here because I think you've had a problem with marketing or communications or manufacturing or on time or whatever, is that true? Okay, cool. We have a way that guarantees X and this is how we do it. And I go very negative on this. If somebody gets really uncomfortable, I'll say like, if you want the outcomes, this is the, this is the only way I know how to do it. Yeah. If, if that's not interesting to you, no problem. You can, you can opt out right now. And if, if you don't like our process, you don't want these outcomes, you know, I'm not going to force you. But if that outcome I described is interesting to you, here's our process. And it starts with all these stupid questions. Yeah. I mean, and if you, if you look at it from the opposite side of the table, right? If once again, if, if you went and sat down with your doctor and the doctor started asking you how you should solve, how he should solve yeah, your problem. Yeah. You know, how would you feel? You know, and so yeah. if, if you have, yeah. you know, so much of it's belief, conviction, but if you don't have a process to follow, it's hard to have belief and conviction in what you're doing yeah. because you're scrambling to think of what am I going to say next while the person's still talking because you don't know where you're going. You're shooting from the hip, right? And right. so, you know, so much of that belief, conviction to your point, hey, can I get a quote? You know, I'd love to give you a quote, but here's my concern. I don't have all the facts yet. If I give you a quote, it's likely either a going to be a misdiagnosis or, you know, maybe I overquote, underquote, or it's not even something that can solve your problem. Would it make sense if we go back to page two um, instead of jumping ahead to page six and maybe we fill in the blanks? And then at the end of our time, I'll be able to say, yeah, here's what I think we can provide for you. Do you want me to work that up for you? Yeah. Um, and just and believe that you're doing it for the right reasons. Right. These the things that, that, that you and I are talking about today aren't tricks. They're not gimmicks. Right. You know, I don't write a proposal after a five minute conversation because I don't know all the details yet. There's so much more information I need to understand. Right. Where are they now? Where are they trying to go? What's the gap in getting there? You know, what are they willing and able to invest in time, money and resources? You know, what are the what's their decision making process, criteria, uh, who all is going to be involved? When when do they need it? Why do they need it? Then? I mean, all this information before I can put a proposal together that makes sense. Absolutely. You know, if I'm assuming all that stuff, I'm going to be wasting yeah. a lot of time of mine. Yeah. So uh, another way to say that, uh, or at least, and maybe it's the exact same thing, and hopefully there's some value in this thinking that if you're feeling rushed, and if you and if you do accept that that challenge to just kind of skip, you can count on the fact that you've missed critical information. Very. And so, a couple of thoughts on that. First of all, is you should sl slow it down with that. Um, you know, I'm in, I'm in charge. I'm the doctor. It's my responsibility. I'm going to listen to you. That is not, that is not saying like, hey, you know, I'm the boss. Shut up. It is, although your doctor probably fairly says that to you, and my, it will ask your gosh. opinion <laughs> in appropriate time. But uh, but you as the sales rep, you, uh, I want your feedback. I'm going to need all that. I'm going to need it at, at, at a certain time in the process. But here here's what I'm going to do in the meantime. And no, we're not going to skip to the step. Uh, you know, skip to the quoting step. I got to slow this down. If I oh, just a little tip or trick, if you if you did it and not the, and I've done this a lot, right? I've done this a lot. Get out of the meeting, and dang it, I promised the quote tomorrow, but I can't or I shouldn't or whatever. Just put it in your back pocket. You know what you can do? You can come back. <laughs> so this is something that took me a long time to figure out. Hey, I thought about it. I realized on me, I skipped a step and I need to ask a few more questions before I give you the quote. Can we get a few more minutes tomorrow or whatever? And so just bear that in mind. If you make a mistake, if you ever, if you mess the process up, yep. you do not have to be perfect. You right. can ask for a reset. You can ask for a mulligan and it works. It doesn't blow the process up. And if it does, it's probably not the client for you. Don't worry about that. Totally but generally agree. speaking, asking for forgiveness is actually something that would probably bond you to the client a little more than, than the opposite. Totally We're about out of time. I got to wrap we this are. up here to get us out on time. So the, what I see the pattern here is, you know, preparation is important, but what's most important about preparation is understanding your process. So you do not betray your own process and skip a step to leave a client in a situation where you can't actually meet their needs because you don't have the information you need. And there's two parts to that being trained mentally, being trained in the process, being ready to slow it down. And also as a sales leader or in an organization, having a proven process that can guide your reps and grade your, 
your team through the three to seven stages so they know what to do at the right time and you can get that right proposal right conversation to your client every single time love it that's our time for today uh we will see you next time good stuff brad thank you so much we'll see you next week all right bye